بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا شهيد يا غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفو فوزا عظيما Enlighten your hearts and majalis with a loud salawat for Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One of our religious obligations during the ghayba of the 12th Imam is to do taqlid. And taqlid means to follow the rulings and the verdicts of one of the scholars, one of the fuqaha, one of the maraja. Because none of us here is a mushtahid. None of us here has gone to the hawza and sought proper education, Islamic education. Thus, we must seek the knowledge of a scholar that has been through the process. Someone that has went to the Hawza, spent his entire life trying to understand the religion of Allah, trying to understand the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt And these individuals, we call the maraja, the scholars of Ahlul Bayt And thus, we follow their rulings and their verdicts. And thus it has been a custom of the Shia to follow the maraja for more than a thousand years. In one tradition, an Imam al-Askari is narrated saying, speaking about taqlid. He says, فَأَمَّا مَنْ كَانَ مِنَ الْفُقَهَاءِ صَائِنًا لِنَفْسِهِ حَافِظًا لِدِينِهِ مُخَالِفًا عَلَى هَوَاهِ مُطِيعًا لِأَمْرِ مَوْلَاهِ فَلِلْعَوَامِ أَنْ يُقَلِّدُوهُ Imam al-Askari says that if you find someone that has knowledge, fiqh, he is from the fuqaha, meaning he understands the Qur'an and the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, he is very well versed in them. So number one, he must have the knowledge. You can't follow the rulings of someone that hasn't studied, someone that is ignorant, someone that is not a scholar. Number one is the knowledge. And number two, the Imam says piety. He must be pious. He must fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be obedient to him. He must have taqwa. So if he has the knowledge and he has the taqwa, then you follow him. The Imam said, فَلِلْعَوَامْ أَنْ يُقَلِّدُوهُ The awam, the layman, everybody else, has to follow the scholar and take the teachings of religion from the scholar. And that's why, like I mentioned, it has been a custom of the Shia for over a thousand years to follow the marja. The marja that is the most knowledgeable of your time, you follow him and the fatwas that they issue for us, we apply them in our lives. But however, recently I have noticed that there is a new movement. There's a new wave of youth in the West that are rebelling against taqlid. They no longer want to do taqlid. They are objecting to taqlid, not because they're against the idea of taqlid, because it's common sense. If I'm ignorant, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what is halal. I don't know what is haram. Obviously, I have to seek the knowledge of the scholars. This is common sense. Even if an Imam al-Askari hadn't said it, the aql, the intellect tells you, you're an ignorant person, you go back to someone that is an expert, and the scholars, they are experts in the Qur'an and in the Hadith. 
So they're not against the idea. But what they are against is the maraja. They tell you, yes, taqlid is good. We have to do taqlid. But the maraja of today, the one sitting in Qom and Najaf, I cannot do taqlid of them. Why can't you taqlid of them? Their argument is this. They tell you, frankly, we cannot follow the maraja because they are out of touch. Because the maraja don't know what we're going through. These youth that are raised, grown in the West, in America, in Canada, in Europe, in Australia, New Zealand, the Western world, they say that these maraja don't know what we go through. They're sitting in their cocoons, in their homes, in the villages, in Qom, Najaf, and they have no clue what we're going through. How can we follow them if they don't know what we're going through? They live in one society that is very different than our society. So how can they issue fatwas from Qom and Najaf when they have no clue in what type of society we live? What are the challenges that we have? What is our lifestyle? We can't follow these maraj. And they'll give you some examples. Number one, the example of salah. They tell you these maraj, they live in Qom and Najaf. Qom and Najaf, you find every corner of every street, there's a masjid. There's a masjid in every block. And when it's Salat time, Dhuhr time, everything closes down, the stores, the shops, and everybody goes to pray. It is so easy to do wudu there, to purify your nafs, your, your body from najasa, and then to pray because the, the, you know, the restrooms are all tahir, they're made for wudu, and so on and so forth. And thus, they tell you that it's very easy to require Muslims there in Qom and Najaf to pray five times, five times a day, every day, while they are in the state of tahara. But then when you come to our society, when you come to the West, when you come to America, for example, this is a secular society. There is no masjid in every street. You're lucky if you have more than one masjid in your city. There are many Muslims that live in the smaller cities. There is absolutely not one masjid in their city. That's number one. Number two, when it's Salat time, Dhuhr time, do they have a break? No. They may have a lunch break. If they're lucky, the lunch break will coincide with Salah. Maybe it won't. So they have, no, they have no Salah break. In addition to that, they want to purify themselves. Tahara, Tahara and Najasa. Before Salah, it's difficult. Everything is Najas here. You've seen the restrooms here, all Najasa. You go to the public areas, it's all alcohol, it's all dogs, and they are Najas. Everywhere you see it's Najasa. And thus, it's not practical, they say. To require Muslims to pray five times a day in this secular society. For Qom, for Iran, for Iraq, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, those Muslim countries, yes, it's easy. Salah makes sense every day five times. And you have to pray your prayers during the designated times. You cannot delay it. But when it comes to here, it doesn't make sense. And that shows you that those maraja issuing those fatwas, you have to pray five times a day, even if we are living in the West. These maraja are suitable for the Middle East, not for America, not for New York and Manhattan. You want me to stand on Fifth Street and pray every couple of hours? That's not how life works here in the West. Thus, their mentality and their fatwas are suitable for the Middle East not for the West. That's why we can't follow them. That's one example they give you. Another example they give you is when it comes to food. The maraja say we have to eat halal food, correct? The meat, the chicken you eat has to all be slaughtered in the halal way, the biha, mudakka we call it. You cannot eat pork, we can't drink alcohol. Requiring that of Muslims in Qom, Najaf, in the Middle East is easy. Why? Because everything is halal there. You think you'll find haram food in Najaf? You think you'll find alcohol in Qom? Everything is halal. You don't have to ask. So it's very easy. Go to the butcher shop, go to the meat shop, restaurants. Everything is halal. So that fatwa in the Middle East is fine. But when you try to apply it in these countries, it's so difficult, isn't it? So many people, they can't find halal food in their cities. Now maybe you're lucky here in New Jersey, New York, you have lots of halal restaurants. But go to Kansas, go to Alabama, go to Mississippi, go to Missouri. And when you go to the smaller cities, there is no halal food. There is no halal butcher shop. There is no halal meat shop, no halal restaurants. Even if there is, maybe there's one or two, they're far. And who says it's halal? They claim to be halal. You go, you're still in doubt. Many restaurants here in America, 
they claimed to be halal. But then once they were investigated, they found that the meat and the chicken was supplied by Walmart, by Albertsons, by all these non-Muslim stores that we can't eat them. So finding halal food is not easy. So you say, you know what? Fine. We Muslims in America, let's live as vegetarians. There's all this vegetarian movement, the vegetarian, vegan, I don't know what the new trend is now. Let's all become vegans and vegetarians. Is that a good solution? Not really. Now obviously we can eat fish too. So we can eat fish and, and in addition to being vegetarians. A problem you have is that many times when you go to a restaurant, you order fish, the fish is halal, you order something vegetarian, they mix wine in the sauces. A few weeks ago, I was at a restaurant somewhere in the US. There was no halal restaurant. I was visiting a place. So I went to an American restaurant. So I ordered fish. After I ordered the fish, salmon, the waiter came, she knew I was Muslim. She's like, sir, I have to tell you something. The sauce that we put on top of the fish is mixed with wine. I was like, are you serious? I can't eat this. I was like, fine, let me have some shrimp. She went, she came back, she's like, sir, let me tell you that our shrimp is beer battered. Oh, okay, I can't have the shrimp. I was like, fine, I'll eat fries. She went, she came back, she's like, sorry, our fries is fried in the same oil that we fry everything else in. So it's not just, I can't have it. What do I eat in, the, such, in such a restaurant? It's not just the meats, is it now? Now they put wine in everything, beer in everything, even the water. You have to ask, please, no, no wine or beer in the water. So it's so difficult to stay adhering to the principles of jurisprudence that this is halal, this is haram, isn't it? And this is what I have to bring to your attention, brothers and sisters, when you go to the restaurants here, just because there's no meat, no pork in it, don't assume it's halal if it's a non-Muslim restaurant. Make sure you tell them I can't have any wine, the sauces, whatever they use to cook it. No wine, no alcohol, nothing beer batter. You'd be surprised how much haram food we're eating without even knowing it. Another problem that you have, fine, everything is halal, there is no alcohol, no wine. But many times they cook your halal food in the same utensil, in the same pots and pans, and they use the same utensils that they used on haram food. They didn't wash it. I've noticed this in, for example, hotels. When you go to have breakfast, there's a person, some hotels, making omelets, correct? So you ask them for an omelet without meat. But you notice they cook your omelet in the same pan that they just cooked for somebody else, an omelet with pork, an omelet with meat. Now this pan is najis. It has to be purified, cleaned with the water. Only then you could use it. Many of us, we forget. So how difficult it is to eat halal food in this country, isn't it? Yet the maraja, they keep on issuing the same fatwas for the people of the East and the people of the West. They make no ex exceptions for us while we have to go through so many hardships just to eat something that is halal, don't we? Last year, I went to one of the stores, I think Walmart or somewhere, and I bought a beard brush was a very nice beard brush. And I was surprised, you know, this is a very, very good beard brush. I used it a couple of days until a brother saw me use it one day. And he's like, oh, Sayyid, you're able to find a halal beard brush? I was like, what are you talking about? Halal, I don't want to eat this, brother. Just want to comb my hair. He's like, Sayyidna, it's not made out of boar. I was like, what do you mean it's made? Of course it's not made out of boar. Boar is a type of pig. So then he's like, Sayyidna, no, these types of beard brushes, they're usually made out of pig hair. So I went, I was sure that he's talking nonsense. I googled it and it said this is made 100% genuine boar. You know, they're saying it in a good way. So I had to throw that away. Even the beard brush we use, it's made, made out of boar, out of pig. Subhanallah, what else is made out of pig and alcohol? You see in these societies, alcohol and pork, pig is... A, you know, part of everything of their life. It's ingrained in everything. So how can you live as a decent Muslim adhering to your faith in this country while the marajah, they give you the same rulings that apply to the Middle East when it's a piece of cake? You know, it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes to sin there. You can't find pork, you can't find alcohol unless you have to go the extra mile. You have to see who's selling it in secret, just like drugs. Here, you want to eat a halal meal? It's so difficult. So maraja make no distinctions. 
between the people, the Muslims, the Shia of the East and the West. They give one ruling to all people and this doesn't make sense. So the Maraja, people of the Middle East should follow them, not us here. That's another example they give you. A third example they give is the laws of gender and hijab. They say when Maraja say all women here have to wear the hijab, yes. When they say they have to wear the hijab, this makes sense in the Middle East, in Qom, in Najaf, in Afghanistan. Why? Because there everybody wears it, everyone accepts it, people respect the lady when she's wearing a hijab, correct? So there it makes sense. But when you come here in the West, many women, they are discriminated because of their hijab. Many women, they are harassed because of their hijab. But yet you find the ruling is the same. Another example, the handshake. You're not allowed to shake hands with a person from the opposite gender, correct? There it makes sense. There in Najaf, no lady will come and extend her hand to say salam. If she does that, she might have evil intentions. Here every day you're put in a situation where someone from the opposite gender wants to shake your hands. You go to a job meeting, they want to shake hands. You go to the bank, they want to shake hands. You go to a restaurant, they want to shake hands. Anywhere you go, you see, you have to shake hands with the opposite gender. But they make no distinction, the maraja. And so on and so forth, the list continues. And based on all of this, they conclude that we can't follow these maraja. Many of these youth, I've seen many of them, and they tell me this, how can we follow these maraja? And unfortunately, there are some so-called scholars, so-called speakers, that also try to advance this you know, idea that the maraja are, maraja are backwards, they're not up to date, they're out of touch, and thus we should not follow them. Now, is this a valid argument or not? Is this a valid argument for us as youth living here to say the maraja, we shouldn't follow them because they're out of touch, because they don't understand what we're going through? This is what I want to speak about tonight. First, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <laughs> and here I'll mention a few points, my friends. Before I mention the few points, what we should understand is this argument, even though it sounds reasonable, it sounds to make sense, but this argument is based on a lot of ignorance. It's based on a lot of misunderstandings. The, these youth, they don't understand how the maraja work. They don't understand how the maraja function. They are completely ignorant of how the hausa works and the maraja work. And that's why they make these accusations. So to better understand this issue, I'll mention a few points. Point number one. The first point that we have to understand is that we have to understand what the role of the maraja is. What is the role of maraja? Do we know? For example, if you're a doctor, what's your job? Your job is to try to help in curing people, correct? If you're a lawyer, you try to help people understand the law. If you're a technician working at a company, your job is to make sure that all the you know, programs and, and, and all the data is in the system and everything. If you're a maraja, what's your job? Many people assume that the job of the marja is to make life easier for his followers, is to make the laws easy and convenient. Is that the job of the marja? When he assumed the responsibility of marja'iyya, did he make a vow that I will try my best to make laws easy and convenient for you, all my followers? No. He made only one vow, and that's to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Ahlul Bayt. He made the vow that my job, Ya Allah, is to convey your message to the people, whether they like it or not. The job of the marja' is to convey the message of Ahlul Bayt, of Rasulullah, of Amir al muminin up until the 12th Imam, to the people, whether they like it or not. Because he is only a messenger that's relaying, that's telling you the message of Allah, the message of Ahlul Bayt. You don't like it, why blame the marja'? He's just a messenger. He has nothing to do with it. This is the job of the marja. And Allah mentions this in the Quran. Where? Allah says in one verse, فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِّنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٌ لِيَتَفَقَّهُوا فِي الدِّينِ وَلِيُنْذِرُوا قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذَرُونَ Allah says, and from every tribe, from every group, from every city, let a few people go seek education, seek knowledge and religion. Go to the Hausa, for example, become scholars, so that the Quran says when they come back to the people, they can warn them. They can warn them of the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so their people could be cautious. 
So the job of the marja, the scholar, is just to warn people. The job of the marja is just to deliver the message of Allah and Rasulullah. His job isn't to make the message look nice and fancy. The job, the job of the marja isn't to make the message easy and convenient. He has to deliver the message in the same way that he heard it. Because of the marja, my friends, if you find a marja, a scholar, that's telling you everything is halal, everything's okay, you don't have to do anything, you shouldn't follow that marja because he's playing with the message. The messenger has now distorted the message. That's not the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though it sounds like music to your ears, it's halal, go and eat. You know what? You can eat the meats of the people of the book. Hijab is not wajib. I don't know what is halal. This is ha everything is halal. It sounds nice, doesn't it? It sounds nice, but is this what Allah wants from me? Do I want what Allah wants? Or do I want what my nafs wants? It comes down to this, brothers and sisters. Many people, they worship their nafs, not Allah. Allah mentions it in the Quran. He says, أَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهُ هَوَى did you not see those people that used to worship their nafs, their desires? Not Allah. They claim to worship Allah. They say, La ilaha illallah. They stand before Allah and pray, but their true devotion is to their nafs. They don't want what's right. They don't want what Allah wants. They want what they want. What advances their own personal needs. So if I see a marja that's telling me everything is halal, everything is, you know, do anything you want, I should. Stay away from this marja. Because remember, the second quality of a marja, Imam al Askari said he has to be someone that obeys Allah. He has to have piety. And a true pious person, a trustworthy person, does not distort a message, does not play with the message. He delivers it as it is. Imagine the mailman. What's the job of the mailman. The job of the mailman is to deliver the mail, whether you like what's in it or you don't, that's not his problem. Because his, pro his job is just to bring you the mail. Imagine if one day the mail guy, he brings you your order from Amazon, you ordered some medicine, he says, you know what, I opened your box, I saw the, the medicine, it's not so good for you, 500 milligrams, I brought you the 200 milligram version, I think it's better for you. What would you do? You'd say, thank you, you made life easier for me? No, you would call the company to have him fired because it's none of his business. And the same way, the mailman, it's none of his business. What's in the mail? Because that's not his job. It's none of the business of the merger. If the message is people like it or not. Because his job is to deliver the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember, the maraja, anytime they issue a fatwa, they tell you something is halal, something is haram, they bear 100% full responsibility. Let me give an example. Imagine the marja' tells you that it is halal to eat something. And then it turns out to be haram on the Day of Judgment. Who bears responsibility, you or the marja'? If I follow the marja', the marja' says, you know, drinking, for example, apple juice is halal. I, I drink apple juice, and then it turns out that it was haram, but the marja' didn't know. For whatever reason, he made a mistake. Will Allah hold me accountable or the marja'? The marja', because I followed him, I relied on his knowledge. Allah will hold him accountable for every fatwa, for every ruling. He has to have an answer. So unless he has a very clear hadith, a very clear verse, he can't say something is halal, something is wajib, something is haram. They have piety. Our, mara our maraja' fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes when there's stories of our maraja' when they would be asked questions, is this halal, is this haram? Sometimes it would take them up to two weeks to answer, why? Because they're not sure, they research and research and again and again, they don't know, is it halal, is it haram? They don't want to give you a quick answer and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold them accountable for that. And that's why if you open the book of Ar-Risala Al-Amaliyya, Tawdih Al-Masail, you've seen it, each marja' has a book, all of his fatwas are in it. How to pray, the laws of Hajj, the laws of Khums, the laws of Zakat, and everything else. Many times they'll tell you, this is wajib ala al-ahwat wujuban, ihtiyat wujubi. Precautionary, obligatory, precaution, if we want to translate it to English. What is ahwat wujuban? Many people don't understand. You know what ahwat wujuban is? It means the marja, he researched the mas'ala, the issue, and he's 80%, 90% sure that it's haram, but he's not 100% sure. So he says this is haram ala al-ahwat wujuba, meaning I'm 90% sure, I'm not 100% sure. So you can follow another marja who is more sure about this. 
He doesn't want to take the responsibility on his shoulder. He says 100% is haram, but the evidence is not so clear. Our maraja' fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of their fear of Allah, they can't just issue any fatwa people like. Maybe they wish, they wish they could put their opinion in it. They wish they could give the rulings as they like, as they desire, but they're not allowed to do that. So that's the first point, brothers and sisters, that we have to understand, is when the maraja are issuing these fatwas, it's not because that's how they like it. It's because that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it. They cannot distort the message. They can't play with the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's number one. Point number two that we have to understand is many times we underestimate the maraja. Many people, they think the maraja don't know anything. The maraja are sitting, wasting their time in the houses. When they say something is halal, something is haram, they issue a ruling. Many people who have not studied one day in the house, they think that they understand more than the maraja. I've seen this many times. They say, you know what? Uh, I don't think this is haram. I don't think this is halal like the marja is saying. The marja, 50 years he spends researching. And you just five minutes, you think you understand more than the marja, unfortunately. We underestimate how much research they put into their work. When the marja tells you something is halal, something is haram, you know how much research he's done? Months, if not years. And then just like that, I come and I criticize these maraja don't know anything. These maraja are backwards. These maraja are so easy to accuse, isn't it? It's so easy to criticize the maraja. They put their heart into their work, my friends. They spend so many sleepless nights, countless hours. They are so serious and diligent about their work. One of our maraja that passed away was a Sayyid Muhsin al-Hakim, the elder generation, they remember him. He died maybe 30 years ago. Sayyid Muhsin al-Hakim, when you read about how serious he was when he was learning to be a scholar, when he was studying. One story they mention is when he was studying, he wanted to research. He didn't have a specific book. That book had a lot of you know, content in it. He was poor, he couldn't buy it. So one of his friends who was also a student studying, he had that book. He asked him, can I please borrow this book a few days and I'll give it back to you. Now remember, back then, most students, they're poor. Books were scarce, not like today, they're publishing them. And a book was very precious to a student. So the student said, his friend's like, I'm sorry, I'm afraid I may give it to you and you may lose it. So he said, no. He said, fine. Said Muhsin al-Hakim said, fine. I will come to your house. I'll sit in your library and I'll do my research there and I'll leave the book so it doesn't get lost. His friend said, you know what, that's, I'm sorry, that's too difficult for us because my house is small and I need that room. My wife, I have a wife, I have kids, so I'm sorry. What does he do? Many of us would say, you know what, I tried my best too bad. Look at the perseverance of a Sayyid Muhsin al-Hakim. Look at how serious he was, how hardworking and committed. You know what he ended up doing? He would come stand in the street in front of the door of the student, of his friend. He would tell him, I'll, I won't come in your house, I'll stand by the door. I will sit in the street in front of your house, I'll take your book, I'll do my research, and then when I'm finished, I'll give it back to you. For years, this, he would do this every day for three hours. You see how hard working he was? He would sit in the street, in the middle of the street, while it was hot, it was cold, depending on the seasons. But that's how serious he was. Another one of our ulama, Sheikh Muhammad Hassan al-Jawahiri, Al-Najafi, Sahib al-Jawahir, he's written one of the biggest and most important encyclopedias on fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, Jawahir al-Kalam. When he was writing this book, you know how serious he was? He did not waste a single second. Do you know to what extent he did not waste time? They say that while he was writing this book, and it took him years to write it. Just so he can tell you what's halal and haram. He deprived himself from comfort, from sleep, from everything. Just so he can tell you the halal, the haram, the hadith of Ahlul Bayt. They say that while he was writing his book, his young son died. It was a big disaster. His young son died. When he came, the people saw him when he came to the funeral. He came while he was holding his pen and paper writing and his tears were coming down. Even when I, my son dies, even in his funeral, I cannot leave the pen. I want to write. This is how hardworking they are. One of my teachers 
told me about a Sayyid Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr. You've heard about Sayyid Muhammad Sadr, Baqir al-Sadr, who Saddam killed 40 years ago. Very hardworking. He says, when I was young, I visited him one day in his house in Najaf. He says it was in the middle of the summer, July. You know how hot Najaf is? It reaches 120 degrees almost every day. He says, I visited him before Maghrib. I went into his small library. He was sitting and just writing, writing. He wrote many books, many, many powerful books, very deep books. He says he was writing one of his books. He had no air conditioner. It was very hot inside. He says he was so soaked in his sweat. It's as if he had just come out of the shower. But yet he didn't care. He was just writing and writing and writing. And then he says, I noticed next to him there was food. There was a food, a tray with food. And it was before Maghrib. So I asked him, what is this? He looked and said, oh, that's my lunch. And this is before Maghrib. This is 6, 7 p.m. His wife had brought him his lunch at 1 p.m. But he was so into the writing and so busy that for five hours he did not even notice the food. This is what our maraja go through. This is what our ulama go through. The fiqh that we have, brothers and sisters, the maraja gave their lives for. And then we come and we criticize. We don't like it. We see how we underappreciate them. How we disrespect the work of our maraja in that way. Every nation, they are so proud of their scholars, of the research of their scholars. Unfortunately, some of us know. All we do is we criticize. Sayyid Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, before he wrote two of his books, he has one book called Al-Iqtisad, Al-Iqtisaduna, The Islamic Economic System. He has a book about Islamic economics. And another book, Al-Bank al Rabawi, The Islamic Non-Interest Bank. How can we start a bank that's not reliant on interest? Before he wrote these two books, do you know how much he spent researching just ec economics and the world banking system? He went to the libraries, the secular libraries. Any book he could find on economics, banking, he bought them. He would study them. He would send letters to the banks asking them how banks work. He did so much research until he wrote this book. We shouldn't see the, the work of the ulama in this way brothers and sisters they went through so much so when the alim gives you a fatwa this is my point my friends when he says this is halal haram he knows what he's talking about because he's done so much research this is the second point do not underestimate the work of the ulama appreciate what they've been through this is number two number three many of our youth think that our maraja are completely out of touch they have absolutely no clue what's going on with the Shia communities in the West. Nothing could be further than the truth. Yes, maybe the Maraja are thousands of miles away. But that, does that mean they have absolutely no means of communication? Brothers, sisters, there's phones, there's internet, there's emails. They have representatives that live here and they give them briefings all the time. They have advisors, maybe him the Marja hasn't been here, but his advisors and his representatives, they've been here and they tell him everything. You'd be surprised how up to date they are. Every day they have briefings about the Shia communities. What happened in Australia? What happened in New Zealand? What happened in Canada? What happened in the US? What happened in the UK and Germany? They have people that give them the briefings every single day. So they are not untouched. They, they are not out of touch. They are not far away and you know completely isolated from us. No, they know exactly what's going on. Me personally. Many times when I visit the Maraja and Qom and Najaf, I give them my own opinion. I give them my own personal briefing. I tell them I went to this community. This community had this challenges. This community had this pros, this cons. I went here, I went there. And I'm just one person. There's hundreds of people like me, scholars, speakers, that go to the West, that speak, and they visit the Maraja and they give them the briefings. They give them their experiences. They don't think they're isolated. My father wrote a book about Islam in the West and how Muslims can advance you know, their interests in the West. And he mentioned many of our challenges, many of our problems here. When he went to visit a Sayyid al-Sistani, he took the book to him. He gave it to him. Now you would assume Sayyid al-Sistani would just throw it, right? Because he's Sayyid al-Sistani, he doesn't need any more knowledge. My father visited him the next year. As soon as he saw him, he told him the book you gave me, I read every single page of it. I took notes. Our maraja know exactly what we're going through, brothers and sisters. They're up to date and they follow our news. 
So when we come and we criticize them, they have no clue what we're going through. No, they do, brothers and sisters. They do. This is point number three. Point number four, when it comes to these youth who have this, you know, backlash, who have this idea, mentality towards the marja'iyah, and they want to drift away from our maraja and no longer do taqlid of them. The fourth point that they have to keep in mind is that many times, my friends, our maraja, they give us the exceptions. You see, the way that they show you, it's as if the maraja give you a law and there's absolutely no exceptions to the law. All maraja, when they give you the laws, there's always a, a disclaimer that if this law is too difficult for you, this law is bringing physical or psychological pain upon you, it is not wajib for you to follow the law. Every maraja. In fact, They've even made it into a principle. When you go to Hausa, they teach you the principles of jurisprudence. One of the principles of jurisprudence is nafyul haraj. What is nafyul haraj? Allah mentions it in the Quran. Ma ja'ala alaykum fiddini min haraj. Allah says there is no law that should cause you pain. The laws of Allah should not cause you pain, distress, psychological pain even. If it does, then you're exempt from that law. So the scholars say any law that causes you severe psychological or physical pain, you're exempt from it. Let me give you an example. We mentioned the example of shaking the hands, right? Sometimes you go all of a sudden to a public place, a female comes to you, or if I'm a sister, a male comes to me, and they want to shake hands with me. Now, you should try your best to not shake your, you know, extend your hands if you can. For example, some people tell me I have my graduation coming and I have to go in, in front of 500 people on the stage and I have to take the certificate from the principal, from the dean of the university. And he may be someone that's from the opposite gender, like I'm a female sister, he's a male, or the opposite, I'm a brother and she's a female. And I have to shake hands with her. What do I do? If I don't shake hands with her, it's too difficult, it's too awkward. I can't, this is going to distress me. It looks bad upon me. I can't. Cope with this psychologically. Maraja say it's halal for you. Every marja. But what the maraja do say is, don't rush to the excuse, to the exception. Try your best to not do it. Try your best. Send an email to your principal. Send an email one day before. And they're very, very, you know, understanding in this country. I've done it many, many times. I have to go, for example, to a church. I have to go somewhere to give a lecture to non-Muslims. I make sure I tell them in the email, look, you know, we're Muslims. Please, no hugging, no kissing, no extending hands between the opposite genders. They say, oh, okay, okay, no problem. We'll tell our people. SubhanAllah, I remember once the governor of Michigan wanted to visit the masjid of my father. She sent him, we want to come and visit the Muslims there. Ahlan wa sahlan, come. So they asked, it was a female governor. So her secretary asked, you know, the people in the masjid, in the email, is there anything we need to know so there isn't any awkward situations? They said, yes. Please, when you see a Muslim man, don't extend your hands because this creates an awkward situation. And no hugging with the males. Okay, no problem. So she went, she would place her hand on the chest. She would say, salam, hello, to all the males. See how understanding? And then all of a sudden, one of the Muslim people, he came and he hugged her. So she's like, whoa, what was that? You told me this is against your religion and you come and hug me? SubhanAllah, they respect our religion more than we do. Now, what is this guy thinking? This is the governor, this is the United States of America. We have to look modern. This is not Iran, Iraq. This isn't Saudi Arabia, isn't it? This is America. But SubhanAllah, when you don't respect your own religion, nobody will. She helps you respect it. Yes, this is your religion, fine. So you have to find a way out. But if you couldn't, you were surprised by the handshake and it's too awkward, too difficult. It's halal. Every single marja says that. I could give you more examples. Another example, many maraja say shaving the beard completely, like with a razor, is haram. This is the fatwa of most maraja. You have to grow a beard. It doesn't have to be too long, you know, like Wahhabis. It could be very short, you know, very, very short. That's fine. Now, but at the same time, they say there's exceptions. If keeping a beard is causing physical harm or psychological harm, meaning you'll get discriminate, discriminated in the country you live in, or you may lose your job because of that, fine, it is halal for you to 
do that as long as you don't rush right away you try to make an exception try your best to follow the commandments of Allah but if you couldn't it's causing psychological problems for you you can't cope with it it's too much too much to deal with it becomes halal for you and I and the list continues and on and on but I'm running out of time so the maraja have said this the disclaimer does exist it's not that the fiqh is rigid it's halal for every person upon every person even if it's causing problems for you and fifth and I think this is the fifth point is the most important one brothers and sisters when you read the ahadith and the Quran what we notice is the Ahlul Bayt told us Allah has told us that look adhering to your faith and religion is going to be difficult there's going to be some bumps there's going to be some difficulties we shouldn't expect everything to be so easy and in one tradition the holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam has been narrated Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad he's been narrated saying yati ala nasi zamanun as-sabir minhum ala deena kal qabid ala al-jamr he says, a time will come upon my nation where adhering to your faith, practicing your religion will require so much patience, it will be just like holding a charcoal. Think that's easy? So of course, there's challenges, brothers and sisters, but that's the whole point of life. Allah created me not to be comfortable. But to test me, there's going to be challenges, there's going to be suffering. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see, is my iman strong or not? And if there's no... You know, challenges, it's not a test. If Allah created me just to be live comfortably, why did He put me in the dunya? Why did He put me in Jannah? Why did He put me in paradise to begin with? Allah put me in this life to test me. And how does Allah test you with these challenges? You come to a country where it's a different society, different culture, there's going to be challenges. It's going to be difficult to follow your religion. Now, is it impossible? No. Is it impossible to live in this country as a devout, practicing Muslim? No, I know so many Muslims. Alhamdulillah. You find ways around everything. It's not impossible. It's just difficult. It's a test. Tests are difficult, my friends. The Quran says, Allah created life and death. He put us in this world to test us. Which one does good? Which one does bad? In another verse, Allah says, Allah says, I will try you through many ways, through suffering. You will lose loved ones, you will lose money, you will suffer, you will, for example, have to undergo fear, hunger, starve. This is a part of life. But then Allah said this in the end. Give glad tidings to the sabirin, the patient ones. Those that have patience, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they will be triumphant. It's worth it, my friends, to be patient. I know it's I know it's difficult. I know it's difficult sometimes, especially in this country, to practice our religion and to stay devout, but it's worth it. The patience that we have to practice here is worth it. The hadith of the Prophet says that there's three types of patience. One, when there's a musibah, there is a disaster in your someone dies, some you know, a disaster in your life. The second you need patience to stay away from haram, of course, because the desires tell you go, go. And you have to say no, that requires patience. The third type of patience, you need patience to do your good deeds. Salah needs patience. Many people don't have that patience. Hajj needs patience. Hijab needs patience. Khums needs patience. Likewise, Siyam during the month of Ramadan, fasting needs patience, doesn't it? But in the end, all that patience pays off. I read a beautiful hadith from the Prophet, I believe, or one of the Imams, where he says on the day of judgment, when everyone is standing to be tried by the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of a sudden in a group, they skip the lines. You see, sometimes you go to areas where there's long lines, and then there's a special line where you can skip it, like in the airports or in some theme parks. All of a sudden, the angels, they notice a group of thousands, maybe millions, they're skipping the lines and they're going directly to Jannah paradise. They're like, wait, 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 what are you doing? Wait, you have to be tried, maybe it'll take a year, maybe 10 years. The Quran says the day of judgment is called one day, but it's 1,000 years long. Can you believe that? Why do you need 1,000 years? Because Allah will ask you about every sin. Every day He'll ask you. Can you imagine how long that would take? So a group, they will bypass, find a shortcut. So when the angels tell them, what are you doing? 
They will tell them, Allah told us, Allah said you can pass. Why? They told them, because in the dunya we had patience. Because in the dunya we had patience, we did our good deeds, even though it was difficult. We stayed away from haram, it was, even though it was difficult. Now our patience is paying off. Now we no longer have to wait. Wait here in the dunya and don't wait in the akhirah. But if you don't want to be patient in the dunya, you're going to have to wait in the next life. So you choose. But the patience of the dunya is nothing compared to the akhirah. You just wait, what, 70 years? And then you have eternal bliss in Jannah. While if I don't have patience in the dunya, I waste my entire akhirah, eternity. And then again, brothers and sisters, look at those that have it more difficult than us. Look at the good, the positive sides of, you know, living in this country. I know it's difficult, the halal food, the salah, you know, the opposite genders and all of that. But look at the bright side. At least, alhamdulillah, we have freedom to practice our religion. This majlis of Aba Abdullah al Hussein that we have now, in many Middle Eastern countries, you can't hold it. Either because the government doesn't allow you or because people are afraid of a terrorist coming to kill you. Isn't this a ni'mah that we can sit here and say whatever we want? Nobody asks us. You know, in some Muslim countries, they invite me, I can't go to speak. They tell you you're a controversial speaker or you have to submit your speeches before. So in the Middle East, yes, they have some perks. Yes, they have masajid. Yes, they have halal food, but there's no freedom. Why did we come here to begin with? There's no safety. Alhamdulillah, there's safety, there's security. Look at the positives. Don't just look at the negatives. Alhamdulillah, so let me not eat meat for a couple of days. Is that the end of the world? There's people now in the Middle East where they're afraid for their lives. You, see what, you saw what happened in Iraq with ISIS. With people, they were afraid for their lives. You see what's happening in Afghanistan? Everyday explosions. When someone goes out, his wife doesn't know if he's going to come back into pieces or he's going to come back in one piece. At least here in this country, alhamdulillah, we don't have to worry about explosions. We don't have to worry about starving. We don't have to worry about hunger, do we? Why don't we look at the bright side? In some places, the Shia, they have to live with taqiyya. If the authorities know that they are Shia, they'll be discriminated against. If the terrorists know he's Shia, he'll be killed. Look at throughout history, during the time of the Imams, the Shia, so many years, they had to live with taqiyya. If the government of Bani al-Abbas, of Bani Umayyah would know they are Shia, they would be butchered like a sheep. They would all worship Allah in secret. And yet, you find they did not use that as an excuse to go away from religion. That just increased their perseverance. Look at Rasulullah, what he went through. You think his life was easy? If you think your life is easy because you have to deal with halal, haram food, see what Rasulullah went through. For three years, he was sanctioned by the people of Mecca. He had to go to the valley, the ravine of Abu Talib, Sha'ab Abi Talib. For three years, he was not able to leave. They sanctioned him. Food was not able to enter. It was Rasulullah, Khadija, Imam Ali, Abu Talib, and some other Muslims. Until a time reached where Rasulullah, you know what his food was? He would eat leaves. Can you eat leaves, brothers and sisters? Alhamdulillah, you have so much food. We have so much food here. Rasulullah had to, for three years, he had to eat leaves to stay alive until the sanction ended. And like I said, our forefathers, what did they go through? What did they go through? Every era you choose, the Shia were persecuted. They were killed. They were treated as mushrikeen, as kuffar. Just read the history of your grandparents. Alhamdulillah, it's a blessing to be in this country. But we still find reasons to complain about the food, about the handshake, about I don't know what. That shows my belly is so full that now I don't know what to complain about. I start thinking, what should I complain about now? Say Alhamdulillah. This is number five and finally number six and I'll end with this inshaAllah. Number six, my friends, am I saying that the maraja are ma'sumeen? Are the maraja infallible? Are they flawless? Of course not. There is room for criticism. There is room for improvement. The maraja have their mistakes. They have their flaws. For example, number one, the representatives here. Maybe the representatives should be more involved. They should be better communication with the communities. Maybe they should be more supportive of the programs. Yes, of course. Number two, communication. Many youth, they say, I can't communicate with the merger. 
You know, I, I have a question I don't know how to ask. Yes, the maraja are a little behind. Now it's so easy, you know, you just go on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, social media. Yes, of course, our maraja are a little behind on that. They could improve themselves in communication with their Shia, the youth. And number three, especially the Shia of the West, they need more support. They need financial support, they need religious support from the marja'iyya to have many programs. For example, why don't we have a Shia lobby firm in the U.S.? The maraja can support it, can't they? So obviously this is something they can improve themselves in. Why don't we have a satellite channel here? We don't have the money, MashaAllah, we have the money, don't worry. Shia, we have a lot of money. Why don't we have more interfaith programs between Muslims and non-Muslims? Shouldn't we have that? So the maraja, of course, they can work on that. But however, my point is don't criticize. If you don't like what's going on, do you know what the solution is? Don't criticize. You yourself go to the Hawza, become a marja, and come back and give your own fatwas. Isn't that a nice solution? If you're not happy with the status quo, you don't like the maraja, they're backwards, you be a marja. Be active, don't be passive. And I always say this, we need our young ones that are born and raised here to go and study in the Hawza. We need more scholars here. We don't want to just import scholars. Because when a, someone is born and raised here, they understand the American mentality. They have lived the challenges. When you live a challenge, it's not like when you hear about it, correct? They know exactly what's going on. They know exactly what the youth want, what they need. They know how to communicate with the youth. That's why I say our youth encourage them to go to the house and study. And before, up until recently, if someone of our youth wanted to go become a scholar, they would have to go to Qom Najaf, correct? But now, alhamdulillah, the Hawza has come to you. Now there are online houses. you know that? I teach in one of them. It's called Imam Hujja Seminary. Hujjaseminary.com. Just Google it. I teach. It's all in English and it's all online. We have no excuses. All the classes of the Hawza taught online and in English. And then if you, after a while, you want to go deep into the you know, Islamic issues, you can go to the Hawza after that. So the Hawza has come to you. We need our youth to be educated, to become scholars, because they are much better. They can serve their communities much better if they are from the community versus being imported from somewhere. That's why I encourage you, brothers and sisters, put this in your mind. That I should become a scholar, a speaker. We need, we have so, you know, we have a big need, a shortage of scholars, of speakers that are born and raised here and that have studied. Now, unfortunately, what I have noticed, there's many speakers that come and they give lectures, but they have not studied. Unfortunately, we should encourage them to also go study in the house. So number one, born, raised here. And number two, they have studied. They have the knowledge. They have the credentials. Only in this way we can advance our religion. Our religion won't always be backwards and behind. So be active, my friend. Just like Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Hussein was not happy with the status quo of his time because he saw corruption in the name of Rasulullah, in the name of Islam. But he was not passive. He didn't just criticize and complain. Imam Hussein did something about it. And that's why he revolted against Yazid. He wanted to create an awareness, awakening in the Muslim Ummah. And he gave everything fi sabilillah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For his cause of reform, which he says before he went to Karbala, when he was asked, why are you going? He said, for reform. I want to reform the Ummah. He gave a big price, brothers and sisters. He gave his soul. He gave all of his children to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the oldest one, Ali al-Akbar, to the youngest one, Ali al-Azhar, all of them. He gave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tonight I want to read you the musibah of a Sayyida Ruqayya alayhi salam the daughter of Imam Hussein, this three-year-old daughter that the Ahadith state loved her father Aba Abdullah al Hussein so much. They say, the Ahadith state, that she was so attached to her father, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Every time he wanted to pray, she used to go take out his rug, the Janamaz, and she would prepare it. She would pray with her father Hussein alayhi salam, very attached to him. Until the day of Ashura came, Imam Hussein was killed, but she had no idea what happened. After Ashura, she asked, where is my father Hussein? I miss him. They told her, your father Hussein, 
he is on a trip. They mean the trip of the next life, of the Akhirah. They can't tell her what happened to her father. So she was waiting. She was waiting that her father Hussein will come back one day from his, from his trip until she lost patience one day. Many days after Ashura, when Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam they were in Sham. Next to the palace of Yazid, there was a deserted land. This land was deserted, it was ruins. Yazid brought Ahlul Bayt and he let them sleep in those ruins and rubbles. There was no roof, can you imagine? When it would rain, it would rain on them in the middle of the heat of the sun. They had to bear all of that. Zainab alayhi salam. She was the caretaker of all the orphans, all the children. She would make sure that all of them sleep and then she would go to sleep. So Zainab alayhi salam, one night when they were in the Kharibah of Sham, Zainab alayhi salam, she, Zainab alayhi salam, she made sure they're all asleep and then she went to sleep. After she went to sleep, she noticed all of a sudden one of the small children she woke up and she's crying. Zainab came, she saw this is Ruqayya. She has waken up from her sleep and she is crying and saying, I want my father. She saw Zainab saw Ruqayya alayhi salam. She had woken up and she is crying, I want my father Hussein. In Dr. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, dar khap dar shradi dabood. Ya martaba ad khap dar shad. Hey, me gaf dar am Hussein kujas. Mehesh gaftan bedar ad Hussein raft safar. Me gaf nalan didan shalan bakalam bood. Alan chehre ya nurani shradi dam. Man bedar am rami kham Hussein rami khayam. She kept on saying, I want my father Hussein. Where is my father Hussein? All of a sudden, Yazid, he is in his palace. He hears commotion in the middle of the night. He asks his guards to go and ask what's going on. They come, they tell him one of the daughters of Hussein, she wants her father. He says she wants her father, take the head of Hussein to her. And they place the head of Abba Abdullah in a bowl. They cover it. They bring it in front of Ruqayya. They place it in front of her. They tell her, young girl, take it, remove the cover. She thought it was food. She said, I am not hungry. They told her, no, what you are crying for, you will find it. Remove the cover. She removed the cover and she saw the decapitated head of Abba Abdullah with blood all over it. Surat Abi Abdullah al Hussein Radid Amma Bichwazib Dun Abadan Puras she threw herself on the head of Abi Abdullah and she cried, Abata, man, in the 